All right, so morning, everybody. Come have a seat. So we're going to talk about something that uh, I sometimes don't have a chance to talk about too often. Um, maybe we can just close the door. Sorry. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. so we're going to talk about something that we sometimes don't often get a chance to talk about. Uh, I just hope everybody can see the screen properly. And that's ophthalmic trauma. All right, so this is basic anatomy of the eye. Nothing too serious, nothing to stress yourself out about. Just as a little reminder, so that you remember what all the parts of the eye are. Right? So we start from the eyelid, the epicanthal fold, the lacrimal area, lower eyelid, pupil, iris, the cornea, the sclera, the conjunctiva underneath. So that's just very basic stuff, right? Basic anatomy. <clears throat> the thing that we want to look at now is what happens when these patients get injured? Because most of us are working in sections where either there's no ophthalmologist available, or if there is an ophthalmologist available, it takes them a long time to get, or it takes you a long time to get the patient to them. Um, or the ophthalmologists, because they are ophthalmologists and they know they are on group two over time, which means they don't have to come out. So they don't come out, which often leaves you in the emergency department with a patient who's got a serious problem that uh, needs to be sorted out. So we're gonna start just with a little thing. I'm gonna start with corneal abrasions, all right? So the cornea, we are, uh, let me get my laser pointer up here, sorry. All right. So the cornea, we're talking essentially about this area here, right? Not the iris, but the cornea that covers the iris, okay? So a corneal abrasion implies that there is an abrasion over there, right? Now, the first thing I want to tell you guys, whenever a patient comes with anything, regardless of what condition it is, but especially with the eye, you need to have a system. So you either go from inside out or you go from outside in, one of the two, all right? So in other words, you start with the pupil, then go to the cornea, then the iris, then the ciliary body, then the sclera, then the conjunct, then the eyelids, or you go the other way right, around. But you need to have a system. You can't just haphazardly look at the eye, right? So the easiest one that most people use is from outside to in, because your eyelids are the easiest thing to see, all right? And then you open the eyelids, you look underneath, and then you look at the sclera, and then you come in and you focus more and more on the inside, right? Some of the challenges we face, how many of you have used a fundoscopia in our emergency department? Not one, isn't it? Because when you pick it up, the light is not working. Even if the light is not working, the dials are not working. Even if the dials are working and the light is working, the lights are so bright, it doesn't even help because the pupil is constricted. Even if the pupil is slightly dilated, you still can't do much because you don't have the atropine drops to dilate it even more. So fundoscopy is one of those things that in theory, we should be doing in every eye exam. But in practice, most of us working in these settings, fundoscopy is not really an option for us. We can do it, but there's not much that we can see, or at least you can't see what you meant to see, all right? So we're gonna do a little example over here. So in this patient, we see the eyelids are actually close to normal. There's not much there. The conjunctiva are okay. When you come to the sclera, what do you notice? There's just a little, little injection of vessels. There's not much. You just see this little redness of the eye, all right? Almost as though the patient went out just to have a little smoke and came back, all right? That's basically what it looks like, nothing more, okay? Then you come to the cornea, do you notice anything? Not much, really. You have to look very closely. If you look very closely, you might notice a little line over there, you might note, but there's not much actually to see, okay? And you look at the iris and you look at the pupil, actually everything's all right. And this is the problem with corneal abrasions. They're extremely difficult to see. You, the thing is you have to be suspicious because what the patient is complaining of and what you are seeing is two different things. So you have this patient who has this eye that's tightly closed that they don't want to let you open. Even when you're opening it, they don't want to look at light, even air that's moving over it, they, they're hypersensitive to it. So because you can't see anything, doesn't mean anything is there. That should actually highlight you to the fact that this may be a corneal abrasion. Now, why is it so sensitive? Simply because of its innovation. Try and touch your eye. It's difficult. That's why we all, anything gets into our eye, we know immediately an eyelash, a bit of sand. We all start screaming because we know how sensitive it is. So it's the same thing with the corneal abrasion, okay? And the thing is, if you're not sure with anything that has to do with the eyes, the safer thing to always do is refer. 
because there's very few things that are true ophthalmology emergencies when ophthalmologist has to see it now most of them are relative emergencies they have to be seen within 24 hours majority of them it's okay so if any of you is looking for an easy life ophthalmology it's the way to go i'm telling you nobody's going to phone you in the middle of the night and ask you anything you will sleep every night when you're on call really and even if they do wake you up your answer is yeah yeah just send them to the clinic in the morning that's it you don't have to do anything else, right? okay so this is the same eye you know, and the staining all right so it's stained with something called fluorescein all right which none of you will see in the emergency department because we don't have it we don't have a dark room we don't have a slip lamp we don't have staining we don't have any of these things but look at what's happening over here this patient actually has quite a bad abrasion of this cornea it's extending quite far and you've got multiple linear abrasions here as well you know? when you see these linear abrasions you must start thinking of something under the eyelid either at the top or at the bottom okay because as the patient moves their eyes and moves their eyeball underneath it gets scraped in this linear pattern okay so <clears throat> always keep that in mind you know? so you can see how difficult it is to actually see such a thing all right so when you check under the eyelid it's one of the most embarrassing things in the world when you send the patient to the ophthalmologist and they phone you back five back five minutes later and they say but there's a huge foreign body under the eyelid because anybody can invert an eyelid my five-year-old at the moment well he says coming out of that phase now but he was in that phase where he turns his eyelids inside out and he runs around to go and scare everybody because it's such an easy thing to do all right so we all know how to invert an eyelid okay you put something small, whatever you've got just there with you and you invert the eyelid and you have a look underneath them right? because it will often tell you if there is something that's going on over there. Now, if the foreign body is quite loose, in other words, it's not embedded inside, with a bit of soft cotton, you can try and remove it, all right? But not with, in other words, you mustn't need a lot of force to remove a foreign body. So if you've got an eyelash that's stuck under here, for example, a little piece of, oh, I don't know, uh, let's say even a piece of wood or metal that's just slightly into the the, the 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 tissue you can try and remove it but once it's embedded such as this one you don't try and remove it yourself all right the problem has to do with the orbicularis oris and you may cause damage to that muscle all right the tarsal plates and all of those things so uh, you know it, it's better to let a specialist do it all right otherwise this the 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 healing that takes place afterward is not done properly can actually lead to a lot of problems which we will talk about just now all right so here we have two eyes do they look the same all right one of these is a subconjunctival hemorrhage any idea which one right very good why not the second one in other words, you answered. Now you have to tell me all the characteristics of a subconjunctival hemorrhage. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. Eyelid is involved. So uh, let's compare the colors of the two. This one is bright red. A little bit dull red. Is this one flat or raised? Flat. This one here is raised. Okay. Uh, th this one has a sort of like a flaring nature, whereas this one here tends to encompass quite a bit of the globe as well, right? So you're 100% right. This is subconjunctival hemorrhage, right? And these are the features of a subconjunctival hemorrhage, all right? It's flat by nature. It's flaring in nature. It's normally due to trivial trauma and things like that. Uh, it's not normally serious, really. Patients come in because they are scared, okay? Patients are worried because they've got a red eye, okay? But subconjunctival hemorrhages don't actually need treatment, okay? Now, in saying that, when our patients come for this, give them Chloramax ointment, give them Panado, give them Proofin, and send them on their way. The reason why I say, if you don't, they will post on Facebook, they will post on Newcastle Advertiser that they went to Maradeni or they went to Flavisa or they went to whichever hospital you're working in and the doctor did nothing for them. And they'll post this picture of a big red eye. It's just this, it's a subconjunctival hemorrhage. You know what I mean? And people will say, oh my God, these doctors at this hospital, see, they don't care for us. We pay their salaries and they don't know. I'm being honest with you, this is what happens, okay? So when you see something like this, even though it doesn't need treatment, Reassure the patient's going to take six weeks, but just give them something. Okay, you don't have to pay for that treatment. Don't worry. 
it's covered. Okay, just give them something so that they at least feel they came to the doctor, they got something and they're going on their way. All right, remember that, okay. <laughs> Don't tell anybody in management I said that. <laughs> they will fire me. <laughs> that is the epitome of wasteful expenditure. Okay. This is called a bloody chemosis. The second one that we saw. All right. So you note how the sclera is swollen. All right. Now this is normally due to trauma. All right. Normally, when you see something like this, it's due to trauma. It's highly suspicious of a penetrating injury. So in other words, something's penetrated that globe. It's now bleeding in the, the cell layers in between. So that's why you're seeing this puffiness and why it's coming out like this. Huh? If it's not from trauma, then it's a sign of a coagulopathy. All right. So a patient's unable to clot for whatever reason. And they have even maybe suffered minor trauma, a small sneeze, something like that. And they start to see this. But the majority of the time is due to trauma. But note the differences. It's not flat. It's raised. It's not bright, it's dull. It tends to be circumferential, but it can only encompass one piece as well, depending on how extensive it may be, how penetrating the injury may have been as well, okay? So it's not to say that they all look like this. Some of them may only have that section, okay? It always requires referral. We need to know what's going on, all right? Very good. Foreign bodies, very common, something that we see. The mechanism of injury is extremely important. So I was using an angle grinder and cutting a piece of metal. I was hammering at wood. I was just in the garden with my kids and we were shoveling a bit of sand. All of these tell you about the potential velocity of the object that entered the eye. The lower the velocity, the less the chance it penetrated the globe. The higher the velocity, the higher the chance it penetrated the globe. So that's why you need to do. If you suspect a penetrating injury, what do you do about it in the emergency department? Nothing. This patient needs referral, all right? However, patient does need tetanus prophylaxis whenever there's a foreign body, okay? Most important thing, if you see rust rings, all right? Don't try and use rust ease or whatever it is. You just don't do anything to it. You just leave it. Rust rings actually need to be removed by an ophthalmologist. There's a specific way in which the cornea is scraped to remove it, okay? So I'm not trying to make you guys ophthalmologists. I'm just trying to show you danger signs. So you know what to do and what not to do, okay? All right. High femurs, blood in the anterior chamber. What do you do with these patients? <laughs> you refer them, okay? So this is a typical high femur that we see. It's layering out of red blood cells in the anterior chamber of the eye. Now, if it's due to trauma, Okay, it's quite easy to understand why it's happening. There's rupture of vessels behind in the anterior chamber, blood has now gone through. However, if a patient has not suffered trauma and has come through with the high femur, you need to look at other possibilities. Coagulopathies, base of brain tumors, there's quite a few other things that also lead to high femurs, okay. So without trauma, the patient actually deserves a clotting profile and a CT brain prior to ophthalmology referral, because the ophthalmology part is actually the last part, okay? Ophthalmologists eventually will drain the high femur, but first we need to know what's going on, what caused the high femur in the first place, okay? This is called an eight ball high femur. Anybody here plays pool? Play pool? Anybody does cocaine? Nobody does cocaine, okay. Well, anyway, a full bowl of cocaine is called an eight ball, all right? And the black ball in snooker is called an eight ball. The reason for that is it's one universal color. Okay, I'm giving away my secrets from my young days. All right. <laughs> so when the anterior chamber is completely filled with blood, it's called an eight ball high femur. All right, that's the name that's given to it because it's completely filled. Okay, in this patient, you can also see there's chemosis over here, all right? Swelling, dullness. So this is all due to trauma, okay? So these are the things that you need to look out for. But remember, these are relative emergencies. They need to be seen within 24 hours, okay. All right, so what's going on here? This patient was working with an angle grinder and now comes to you. Describe what you see, anybody. On Zoom, here, you can talk, you can chat, you can do whatever you need. What do you see? Start from inside out or outside in? Let's talk about the eyelids first. What do you see? 
No, I mean, no, I'm saying your island, your island, not much, isn't it? Island actually also right. All right, we come to the conjunctiva over here. Slightly reddish, yeah. You come here to the sclera. Again, slightly reddish, isn't it? Okay. Uh, you come to the cornea, not the iris, eh? I'm talking about the cornea, the shiny part on top. Yeah, that's my laser pointer. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm joking. You see something here, isn't it? All right. When you look at the iris, uh, the colored part underneath, what do you notice? It kind of extends down into that, isn't it? All right. And then what do you notice about the pupil? Very good. Irregular pupil. All right. In fact, if you turn your head a little bit, it kind of looks like a teardrop pupil. Okay. So what do you think happened here? If this patient was working with an angle grinder and it's now come through. So he's, had, he's been working with something that revolves at thousands of reps per minute. And now he comes to you and he says, there's something in my eye. What do you think happened? Oh, yeah, exactly. Something flew out, hit him in the eye. Can you see it? No, you can't see the foreign body. This is not a foreign body. This is a cut, all right, that's gone through. And that's a teardrop pupil, all right? So this is a high suspicion of an intraocular foreign body, okay? Uh, next week, I'm actually gonna show you some ultrasounds of an intraocular foreign body, but I just wanted to show you what it looks like or what it potentially can look like. The mechanism of injury is very important. Now you understand why the mechanism of injury, as compared to somebody who says, you know what, I was shoveling a bit of dirt. You might most likely find the, the foreign body within the anterior chamber or even stuck outside the cornea or on the sclera. But with the, with the high velocity, it just simply shoots, shoots through and it gets stuck in vitreous humor. Have you guys ever seen vitreous humor? It's like jelly, like literally like hard jelly. So you can imagine almost like ballistic gel, like you're shooting a nine millimeter gun. So it passes through the front very easily. But once it hits that ballistic gel, that gel just, wah, just grabs it, you know? So it doesn't pass through. And now, of course, a bullet itself will pass through. I'm talking about these small little things, you know? They get stuck in that jelly, all right? The thing is with these, the pain is often not that severe. Because if you compare it to that abrasion, that abrasion, we had a large area that was affected. We had linear scratches. We had a nice big abrasion there. That's why the patient was feeling so much of pain. In this case, this patient's just got a little area here that's affected, all right? The pupil, the iris, all of that, they insensate. They're not gonna feel anything. The cornea has just got this little thing. So the patient comes and tells you something, but the pain is not that bad. Do you get what I mean? So that's when you really need to suspect this could be intraocular, all right? And of course, it can't remain in the, in the eye. So what do you do? Very good, okay. So we haven't done anything to any patient so far. We've just taken a history, done an examination, and we have referred, okay. Now we're gonna do some fun ones. Any idea what this is? What's going on here? So this is fundoscopy. Sorry? No, it's not a cataract, no. With a cataract, you can't see the posterior chamber. Difficult, huh? What could it be? First of all, do we see any vessels? Don't see any vessels. What do we see? You just see this change in shading. Um, somebody wants to say something, sorry about that. All right, yeah, retinal detachment. Good guess, could be retinal detachment. What else could it be? Lots of things there. Eh? Could be a, a vitreal hemorrhage. It's quite a bit. It's, a, it's actually a lens dislocation. Okay, sorry, let me just move it along. So this is a lens dislocation, all right? It's very easy to miss. Now, look at this pupil, how massive it is. Do you think the patient walked in with a pupil like this? No, not at all. This was done in a nice dark room. Lovely madriatics given, not uh, yeah, madriatics given to the patient, allowing the patient to uh, what you would call it dilate their eye. There is a lovely fundoscope that's being used over here to look inside. What do you think we'd see with a normal pupil? Nothing. You're not going to see anything. All right. These types of things, basically. Lens dislocations will give you eye disturbances, visual disturbances, all right? Visual disturbances being duplication of vision, spinning of the vision. There's quite a few things that happen, all right? So that's what the patient will complain of. What do you do with this patient? 
you refer. Okay, do you get what I'm trying to tell you? There's actually very little that we can do in the emergency department for most types of eye trauma because it's such a specialized thing. But the importance is that we recognize it, all right? So what should we have seen if we had looked through properly? The reason why we can't see anything at the back, the lens is also refracting our light. So that's why we can't see the retina at the back. We can't see the optic disc. We can't see the, what do you call those things? The, the veins, you can't see the optic nerve. You can't see the, I know these terms. They're just slipping out of my head at the moment. Come on, help me, help me. Come on, macula, yes, all of those, all right? So you can't see any of those, okay, because of the refraction of the light over here, okay, right. Now, this is called iridialysis, okay? It's not called that because you do dialysis of the eye, all right? It simply means that the iris has been removed from the ciliary body, all right? So your ciliary muscles sit over here, and then the iris gets pulled away, all right? Patient will complain of visual disturbances, of course, because now this piece of the iris is blocking that vision of theirs, and they'll complain of a double pupil. This is to teach you terminology, okay? Because after trauma, when you speak to an ophthalmologist, you can't speak, tell the ophthalmologist, this eye looks a bit funky. I'm not sure what's going on, is it? And say, well, yeah, that's good, I'm sure it's, I'm sorry, it looks funky. You need to know the terminology of who you are speaking to. Agreed. So this is one of the terms that you need to know. Iridialysis is quite common in trauma. It doesn't, it's not often this extensive, but it can just be one little part of the day. Okay. Is there anything else that you can notice? Not much. In fact, this is not necessarily due to trauma. Uh, so what do we do in an emergency department? Nothing. We refer these patients. Okay. Very good. All right. Let's try a proper trauma case now. So what do you see? The important part is not to get everything right. The important part is to notice what you do, what you can. So what do we notice on the eyelid? Yeah, you notice good, some abrasions, some bruising. What do you notice about the eyelashes? Covered in blood, yeah, matted together, all of that. So it's obviously due to trauma, okay? There's no doubt about it. Conjunctiva, we can't see too well. What can you see on the sclera? Maybe you can notice there and there. Hemorrhage. Something, there. isn't it? Maybe a yeah. subconjunctival hemorrhage, maybe a little chemosis over there. But let's get to the fun part. What do you notice here in the cornea, iris, pupil area? What's going on there? Uh, w pupil or iris, which one are you talking Okay, and what's happening to that pupil and that iris? Regular. Is it in its normal place? Is it maintained within the anterior chamber? Where is it going? Yeah, and down and one more direction. Out. So it's protruding. All right, do you notice that? There's a laceration of the cornea and all the contents of the anterior chamber are starting to protrude. Can you see that? Yeah, yeah. Can you see it over there? Sure. Do you know? Yes. Pupil looks like that, exactly. So everything's being pulled out. So this is a corneal laceration with protrusion of the anterior chamber, okay? Do you think it's a small thing or a big thing? Big pain. Yeah, this is one. Well, there's the change to shape, bit of iridialysis, and extrusion of contents. This, the reason why this is a big thing is because here we can see what's happening to the anterior chamber. We don't know how the posterior chamber is being affected. So this is one of the few times that an ophthalmologist has to get up, change, and drive to the hospital and see what's going on. And they come in very grumpy, yeah? very <laughs> grumpy, because it's like twice a year, it's like twice a year. And in fact, a lot of them will even tell you they're not coming, put the patient in the ward, they will see the patient the next day. No, they will, they will, don't worry, all right? But if you are working in a proper setting with people who actually give a damn, they will come out and see this patient, okay? Because they need to know what's going on. How bad is it, okay? And if you are lucky enough to work in a place where you've got high frequency ultrasound, you can actually have a look for them and see what's going on. But we'll talk about that in another lecture, all right? 
But just so long as you know, that's what it is. So let's describe some injuries that we see over here. All right? So let's start with this one. What do we see here surrounding the eye, first of all? It's obviously a laceration, isn't it? Okay, how far does the laceration extend? Does it stop there? Does it carry on? Carries on, right? So it carries on into the globe over there. Tell me about the eyelids. Well, let's say this part's around. Is there anything that you notice over there? Mm -hmm. All right, very good. Well, that's swelling of the eye, but not swelling of the uh, of the lids itself, right? Uh, what do you call these two corners? Does anybody remember? No, the epicantral fold is there, but you close. That's called the lateral canthus. This is called the medial canthus, all right? So what do we notice on the lateral canthus? Yeah. Uh, well, an abrasion, blood pooling, whatever you want to call it, that's fine. That's not a problem. And on the medial canthus, what do we notice? Again, a bit of swelling of that, right? The, yeah, the, this is a bloody chemosis all right, that you can see there, all right? What we described earlier. But once your eyeball protrude, protrudes from the orbit, that's called proptosis. Okay, so this patient has proptosis. Okay. Can we see any iris? Can we see any pupil or anything like that? So chances are this is filled with blood. So that's called an, remember cocaine, pool. Very good. Eight ball hyphema. Okay. What's contained on the medial side over here? Quite important structures, a gland, a duct. Yeah, lacrimals, very good. Right? So your lacrimal duct, lacrimal gland, all of that. And you've got a cut that's going through the eyeball as well with this chemosis. So minor injury, major injury, major injury, isn't it? But the thing is, you have to be able to describe it to the person. So what you are going to describe to the ophthalmologist is that you've got a patient with facial trauma, you've got globe rupture, right? Because that's essentially a, a uh, a more concise way of saying that you've got a laceration with bleeding and things like that, right? Injuries to the lateral canthus, medial canthus, and an eight ball hyphema, right? Instead of saying, I've got a patient who's been cut and has a swollen eye. But that doesn't mean anything to an ophthalmologist. Using the terms that the ophthalmologist understands is what gets your patient sorted, right? Okay, very good. What do we see here on this one? So we can see some mucky stuff, eh? There's something, all right? It looks a bit mucky. Very good, there could be iridialysis over there, all right? Uh, but let's go section by section. On the sclera, what do we notice? What's going on there? Something, eh? Something going on. As you said, it could be iridialysis. What do we notice about the pupil, the iris? It's somehow not continuous, eh? It looks almost as though something's punched through there, all right? So this is actually globe rupture. That globe has ruptured, okay? And this is quite typical of what a globe rupture can look like, okay? This what you're seeing all on the outside is vitreous humor leaking out from the back, okay? Jelly-like substance that's coming out, right? This next one should be quite easy now, right? So we don't have eyelids and all of that to look at. What do we see on the sclera? Maybe they the bit of a subconjunctival hemorrhage, a little bit there. What's this called? Blood collecting in the anterior chamber. Very good. Hyphema. What do we see here? The contents are protruding. Very good. So the orbital contract, I mean, uh, anterior chamber contents are protruding through the cornea because the cornea has been lacerated by this uh, trauma. And we have an irregular shaped pupil, all right? Or a teardrop pupil, okay? So you need to know those types of things to be able to describe to your ophthalmologist what's going on, right? Once you can do that, then it becomes a lot easier. Okay, let's try another one. So you've got this patient, the ophthalmologist tells you to send the patient to the ward. <laughs> Now you can't just let the patient go. They're not gonna sit like that the whole night, all right? So these are two methods that you can use to protect the eye. If you're lucky enough to have a proper eye shield, we have one or two lying around. That's how you place it over the eye. If you don't have an eye shield, cut a polystyrene cup in half and just tape it over. At least nothing will affect the eye. 
All right. So that's the easiest ways, especially in our situations. Ideally, you should use a proper metal eye protector that's perforated as well to allow for flow of air and so on and so forth. But since we don't have those, this is probably our best bet for protecting the eye. And if you're lucky and the ophthalmologist is coming out, still protect the eye until the ophthalmologist comes. Okay. So at least that's how we know. Yeah. It's okay. Don't worry. I mean, even in this one, you can see the perforations are covered up by tape. So don't worry. It's not actually, it's supposed to. Nobody does it. Okay. So we're going to talk about the eyelids now, right? Okay. In the eyelids, the most important thing to remember is the tarsal plate. All right. I want you guys just to remember this part of it. It's a very nice looking diagram, but just remember this part. So when the eyelid is open, there's a grayish plate semi-solid plate, cartilaginous plate that sits in the eyelid that's called the tarsal plate. Everybody remember that, okay, as we're going forward. This is now when we have eyelid trauma, all right? What I want you guys to notice, now in this one here, this is a lacrimal duct injury, all right? I'm not too worried about this one, but these are the ones that I'm worried about. Can you see this here? This little grayish part, it may be a bit difficult. The resolution is not too good over here. But this is more or less where you should see the tarsal plate, all right? What are you going to do with these patients with these massive lacerations? Here we can see even lacrimal duct injury, things like that. What are you going to do with these patients? You are going to refer, that's for sure. Are you going to suture them? No, why not? There's a specific reason why not. Not just because it looks scary. Okay. The thing is that if we try and put these patients together in the emergency department, these patients need something that we call an anatomical approximation or an anatomical repair of the eyelid. This has to do with, again, with that orbicularis oris muscle, okay, as well as the tarsal plate. If you do not align that thing exactly, this is what your patient ends up with. All right. Ectropion, entropion, leg of thalmos, all these fancy terms that we all learned a long time ago, basically to mean the eyelid sticks out, the eyelid points in, the eyelid can't close, all of these things because we haven't closed it properly. So what's going to happen to these patients? They are going to get recurrent ulcerations, recurrent dryness, recurrent perforations, and eventually lose their eyes, not to mention the disfigurement. Have a look at this. That actually doesn't look too bad, am I right? It actually looks quite decent in terms of the repair. I mean, the patient, the person's tried to put everything together as close to possible as they can, but look at the result. Do you get what I'm saying? So once you have anything that goes through that tarsal plate or is coming close to that tarsal plate, do not touch it. Do not touch it at all because it needs to be done in a very particular manner. All right. Now, if you have a chance, go and read about this. It's a very wonderful procedure, eyelid suturing. Now, uh, would, have you ever sutured with 6-0 nylon? How tiny is it? Absolutely tiny. This is done with 7-0. All right. So it's a microscopic suture. All right. Sometimes they do use 6-0 if they're out of 7-0, but ideally it should be done with 7-0. All right. And the way that the suturing is done, is that each, well, besides the tarsal sutures, the skin sutures, each suture covers the, uh, what you would call it, the end of the other suture. So it's quite a complex procedure. It needs to be done in theater. And the good part about it is it can be delayed for up to 48 hours. So there's no rush. It doesn't have to be done that night. But the most important thing is that you don't attempt to do it yourself in the emergency department, because that's when we'll have problems. Right? Yeah. Don't touch it. And the thing is, like during the day, it's fine. If we're not sure, we send the patient up. Very small, a millimeter, you know, tiny ones, we don't have to touch. They'll repair spontaneously. If we suspect it's superficial to the tarsal plate, there's no harm in the ophthalmologist seeing it and the patient coming back and, and them saying, you know what, just put in a suture or two, that's fine. But the majority of them, they will take over and they will do. All right. And if it happens in the middle of the night, you keep the patient in the ophthalmology ward or you refer to your ophthalmologist 
whatever you have a chance to do, okay? The most important thing is don't attempt to just switch it yourself. So let's describe what we see over here from outside to inside. Can you see the eyelids? Are they eyelids? It's a simple question, are they eyelids? No, there's no eyelids. So how do you lose your eyelids? Any idea? What type of force do you think would cause your eyelids to be removed? Shearing force, all right. So in other words, the patient lands on something or is hit by something that does that, okay? And shears off the eyelid. Alternatively, you cut off the eyelids. But most of the time, it's a shearing force, okay? So somebody riding a motorbike, without a helmet, falls off and lands, right? can shear it off. Somebody is punched, falls against the wall, shears off their eyelids. All right? So that's the first thing you have to notice. There's no eyelids over there. All right. What do you notice here? Medial canvas. Mm, very good. Multiple injuries, actually. You can't even make out. It almost just looks like a pulp, pulpy mess. Lateral canvas. Also, yeah. Disrupt, disrupted quite a bit. When we come to the actual sclera, conjunctiva we can see is red, right? When you come to the actual sclera, what do you notice? Okay, yeah. What would you describe that part as? Just that little section. That's a subconjunctival hemorrhage, eh? All right, this section here that's a bit more raised, what would you say? It looks more like a bloody chemosis, all right? Very good. And then when you come to these structures here, what do we notice again? We've been seeing it a lot. What's happening to the contents of the anterior chamber? They're protruding out. Okay, so this eye is in danger. This patient has got multiple problems. But again, you have to use the language of the ophthalmologist so that they understand. So when you phone them, you have to describe all of these injuries sequentially so that they know that this patient is quite seriously injured. And it doesn't matter whether it's eyes, ENT, cardiology, that's the unfortunate part of working in the emergency department. They don't have to speak your language. You have to speak their language. And if you don't speak their language, they're not coming. It doesn't matter which department it is. That's the difficulty sometimes of working in our department. Okay. But now I hope you guys have a bit more of an understanding. All right. So these are just, it's just uh, giving you all of those uh, things that we have. All right. So ophthalmology and ophthalmic trauma quite difficult, especially for us, because there's not much that we can do besides refer. So our main thing is to recognize and be able to explain to the ophthalmologist what is going on. And if you can do that, you've saved your patient's eye. You've done a good job. No ophthalmologist is gonna expect you to repair this because this needs to be done under microscopy. It needs to be done in theater. It needs to be done with sutures that can't even be seen with the naked eye, all right? So that's the important thing. I just want to see, right? So. Sometimes we get patients that are hit directly from the front and they start getting quite a severe swelling, all right? Or what we call orbital compartment syndrome. So there's this proptosis that's taking place. And as the proptosis is taking place, your patient will start telling you that my vision is decreasing. I can't see out of the eye. What that eye needs is space. So it's a rare procedure, but occasionally we have to do something called a lateral canthotomy. I hope to God that none of you ever have to do this procedure. And I'm showing it to you more for interest sake, so that if ever in the future you hear the term, you know what it describes, okay? Let's just hope it starts. I'm Dr. Jess Mason, and this video shows illustrations and real footage of a lateral canthotomy. That's a procedure to release an orbital compartment syndrome. So if you have a bunch of pressure pushing on the eye, usually that's from a retrobulbar hematoma, that's a pocket of blood pushing the eye forward. We want to create an incision so we can basically let the eyeball come forward. If you're only going to remember one number, I want you to remember 40. 40, that's 40. It's the intraocular pressure when you need to cut and release the compartment syndrome. Let's go through the steps of the procedure. First step is you want to get it numbed up, so lidocaine with epi, be a nice doctor. Second, you're going to crush the lateral canthus with a clamp. This devascularizes the area. 
Now, here it is in the real procedure. You want to leave that clamp there for about one minute so it doesn't bleed like stink when you cut. And that's coming up in step three. Cut the lateral canthus. You're going to cut towards the orbital rim on the side. See, it's like, usually you can't see it. You can just feel it if it's too swollen. Yeah. Next, you're going to cut that lateral canthal ligament, which has both a superior and inferior cruce. Sort of looks like a wishbone on its side. You want to cut down, cut that inferior cruce first. Sometimes this releases enough pressure on its own, but if not, cut the superior cruce. Now, it can be real hard to see, even for you, not just the patient. There's a lot of blood, oozy stuff. So get in there with one of your instruments, get some tactile feedback. It sort of feels like a guitar string. Yeah, it feels like it's done. At the end, recheck your intraocular pressure to make sure it dropped, and this is how it should look when you're done. I hope to God none of you ever have to do that. It's a terrifying procedure from what you can see. It's terrifying for the patient because the patient's awake, and it's terrifying for you because what if you rupture the globe? You know? So it's just something that I wanted you guys just to see, to know that it is an option. The reason being sometimes, sometimes, if you are lucky enough to be in a center where there are 24 hour tertiary services and things like that, you can call an ophthalmologist to do this for you. They are all trained. And if you have trained in emergency medicine, then we train in how to do this procedure as well. Okay. But if you ever hear the term lateral canthotomy, at least you know what it means. Okay. So I hope you guys enjoyed it. I know it was quite a bit to take in. This is just a joke to have finish off a little bit, all right? So eye trauma, the message at the end of the day is identify as much as you can, but the majority of the things will have to be referred to an ophthalmologist. And the reason why I say this is, if you miss minor things and send the patient home, that patient's eye cannot regrow if you have caused problems. Do you get what I'm saying? Even though you can't do anything, but if you don't direct the patient in the right way, you still basically giving that patient no hope of recovery as far as that eye goes, okay? So we're gonna do a few questions just to finish off at the end, like what we've done before. Uh, so I know it's a bit difficult to read over there, so I'll read it, read it out. And uh, you guys can tell, the guys on Zoom can answer as well, but we'll just go through it one by one, okay? So basically you can tell me whether it's true or false, all right? In corneal abrasions, all right, so you think back to corneal abrasions. We often have significant physical findings. In other words, we can see a lot. No, very good. They are often minimal physical findings. That's true. Patient is often, pain is often severe and disproportionate to the findings. That's true. Your patient doesn't have many physical findings, but is complaining of a lot of pain. Pain is the main and only complication of a corneal abrasion. Mm -hmm. What's the main complication of a corneal abrasion? Ulceration, infection, spread. <laughs> okay, that's why we're worried. We're not worried about the pain. The pain is telling us where to go. It's kind of like a patient having a fractured femur. You gave them pethidine, now the pain is gone. No problem, go home. No, 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 you still have to sort it out, right? Ulceration and perforation are the main complications? That's true, okay. Embedded foreign bodies, all right? They should be removed carefully by a specialist. Yes. Should be removed in the emergency department. No. Must be palpated with force externally on the eyelid. Never. You'll always you push it through that globe, all right? Can cause ice rink linear abrasions or skating rink linear abrasions. They can. Remember, as your patient's eye moves, that foreign body is scraping and as the eyelid moves up and down, so it creates those, like how uh, lines look on an ice rink when somebody's skating, all right? Uh, they never involve the ocularis muscle. False, they can. When they're embedded and deeply embedded, they can go all the way up to the ocularis muscle, all right? Thank you to the person who's voting. Voting is anonymous, by the way, yeah? Okay, so uh, a bloody chemosis signifies injury to the globe, true or false? True. Tends to be darker in color, true. Subconjunctival hemorrhage is lighter in color. It's raised rather than flat, true. 
does not have to involve the entire globe. True, it can just involve segments of the globe. Right? A hyphema is another word for an ocular lipoma. Pause, okay. Signifies injury to the anterior chamber in trauma. True, occurs only in trauma. Pause, is a relative emergency. True, okay. Intraocular foreign bodies are more likely in high velocity or low velocity projectiles. High velocity, very good. We're almost done. Eyelid lacerations must be sutured immediately in the a &E. Must be sutured anatomically. True. Tarsal plate transaction is of no consequence. False. The lacrimal duct can be easily injured on the medial canthus. True. Repair can be delayed if unsure of severity. True. Very good. So you guys did listen. All right. So a lateral, can a lateral canthotomy is a vision saving procedure. True. By releasing the pressure, it decreases the amount of. So it's like any compartment syndrome. If you have a compartment syndrome of your arm or of your finger, eventually it cuts off blood supply. So compartment syndrome here can also cut off blood supply. Should be used in all cases of eye trauma. Pause. Can be done by inexperienced staff and complications are unlikely. Pause. Should be used for orbital compartment syndrome. True. Very good. Okay. So thank you for the person who was voting as well over there. Uh, stop over there. Okay, so I hope you guys enjoyed it. Hope it was okay. I know these Friday ones are a bit long. I'm trying to compress big, big chapters of textbooks into a little bit so that you guys can understand it a bit, all right? So we'll end over there. Next week, we're gonna cover medical conditions of the eye. It's boring. Have some coffee on that morning, but I'll try and make it as exciting as possible. Okay, all right, thanks. Unless there's any questions, sorry, I forgot to ask. No questions? Okay. Any questions on Zoom? Nothing. All right. Thank you very much. We'll say goodbye to everybody. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.